Well, blow me down. Use change is hard to line. Here comes a guy what thinks he's a fighter. Watch this. <laughs> Oh, where are the Arab's apple? Oh, oh! Popeye the Sailor is the rough and tough seaman with a heart of gold created in 1929 by cartoonist Elzy Chris the Seeger. Unlike most of the characters we have explored in this series, Popeye didn't start his life in the animated medium, but in newspaper comic strips. And while our cartoon origin stories usually begin with a fight for fame and success, this one begins with pure chance. Popeye was essentially a happy accident, an intended one-off character who gained unanticipated anticipated popularity in comics, leading to an insurmountable success in cartoon shorts, rivaling even the likes of Mickey Mouse. Initially produced by the Fleischer Studios and Paramount Pictures between the 1930s and 1950s, Popeye cartoons would later cross into the television era under the likes of Hanna-Barbera and Gene Deitch. Unfortunately, Popeye found himself victim of the modern times, with various reboots and reimaginings, each more watered down than the last, struggling to uphold his popularity throughout the decades. In 2019, Popeye turns 90 years old, and to celebrate, I will trace his entire evolution from 1929 to now. To do so, we will look at the character's history from comic to screen, and the changes in his design, personality, and stylistic approach prevalent across a near century of strips, shorts, television series, and feature films. In this edition of Cartoon Evolution. <laughs> Thimble Theatre by E.C. Seeger began its run in the New York Journal on December 19, 1919, soon finding itself syndicated in numerous newspapers by the King Features Syndicate. Initially, the comic took a traditional form, as a gag-a-day or laugh-a-day strip. Continuity and serialised adventures certainly weren't the norm, however Thimble Theatre featured a recurring cast of characters, Harold Ham Gravy, his fiancée Olive Oil, and her brother Castor Oil. Over time, the strips grew larger, and in 1925, the Sunday features transitioned into colour. Seeger, who is often considered one of the most groundbreaking and influential cartoonists of all time, used these extended strips to evolve his stories from simple gag pieces to continual narrative adventures, making the Thimble Theatre one of the first strips to tell serialised stories. These stories further fleshed out its characters as they were sent off on crazy exploits and questionable entrepreneurial ventures. Thimble Theatre wasn't overly popular in its first decade, only being printed in 12 newspapers nationally. However, in January of 1929, something was about to shake up the strip forever. In one story beginning in September of 1928, Ham Gravy and the Oil sent off towards Dice Island, a faraway locale home to a shady casino at which they planned to swindle millions with the help of a lucky bird or Whiffle Hen. The team buy themselves a boat and plan to hire the first sailor they come across to captain it. In the January 17, 1929 strip, they meet a crotchety, no-nonsense, one-eyed, toothless sailor who goes by the name Popeye and is willing to head the expedition for a small fee. Sega noted that Popeye merely happened into his strip. He wasn't intended as anything but a simple plot device designed to get the characters from A to B. However, over the course of the story, Sega found him a great source of comedy and used him in a pivotal role. Many of the attributes that would form the Popeye character appeared in Dice Island. His irritable personality, bad temper, blunt attitude, savvy nature, notoriety for quick wit and sarcastic quips, all juxtaposed with his heart of gold and gallant nature. His superhuman strength was also explored, initially explained as attained luck from the Whiffle Hand. Popeye's design was fairly simplistic, in keeping with the style of the strip at the time. However, his iconic look was almost immediately established. His ever-present tobacco pipe, bulging tattooed biceps, and instantly recognisable screwed-up face that, as described by Olive Oil, looks like a ship 
shipwreck. In fact, Popeye was allegedly based on a local from Sega's hometown named Frank Rocky Feigl, who had a similar appearance and disposition. Popeye was initially dressed in a white sailor uniform, obtaining his iconic black shirt during the story in a game of chance. Popeye was a character unlike any that had been seen in comics before, and instantly became a favourite of readers. Perhaps not realising, however, Sega removed him from the lineup in the following story as originally intended. Fan backlash immediately ensued, as letters flooded in imploring Sega to bring him back. Realising that his one and done character had spawned an immense interest which he hadn't seen before, Sega soon brought Popeye back giving him the starring role. By 1931 the strip was renamed Thimble Theatre starring Popeye, and refocused to follow the wacky exploits of the scrappy Sailor Man, while Ham Gravy was dropped from the strip, never to return. As a result, Popeye won over the affections of Olive Oil and the two became coupled, even receiving a child in the mail named Sweet Pea in 1933. The newly revamped Thimble Theatre became one of the most popular strips of the 1930s, growing in syndication to over 500 newspapers, with Fortune magazine calling it their second favourite cartoon strip behind only Little Orphan Annie. Comics historian Brian Walker credited the popularity with Sega's masterful blend of comedy, fantasy, satire and suspense. While Peanuts creator Charles M. Schultz would call Popeye a perfect comic strip, consistent in drawing and humour. Popeye's design slowly refined over time, with his face rounding and flattening out and his biceps bulging like balloons. Likewise, his character continued to grow, with iconic elements added such as his large consumption of spinach becoming the source of his superhuman strength, though he was rarely shown eating it. Not only did Popeye have a powerful punch, he could also survive being peppered with bullets, powers he used to defeat the members of his ever-growing rogues gallery. In retrospect, Popeye is considered one of, if not the first superhero, or at least a precursor to those who followed. In fact, Jerry Siegel cited him as one of the strongest influences for he and Joe Shuster in the creation of Superman in the late 1930s. Meanwhile, in the early 30s, animated cartoons were at peak popularity and swiftly evolving. After a decade of silent shorts, sound cartoons had become the norm and the introduction of colour was changed changing the game once again. Every major studio was distributing scores of cartoons every year, produced rapidly by various independent animation houses. One such was the Fleischer Studios, co-founded by brothers Max and Dave Fleischer at the dawn of popular animation in the early 1920s, helping to revolutionise the art form in its infancy. In 1930, the Fleischers introduced Betty Boop to their Talk cartoon series, a character who soon became their most popular, spinning off into her own headline series by the end of 1932. However, in an era where Walt Disney was taking the world by storm with Technicolor silly symphonies and comedies featuring the world's most beloved cartoon character Mickey Mouse, the immense popularity of the sultry and seductive Betty Boop was not enough for the Fleischers, who found themselves under constant pressure from their distributor Paramount Pictures to develop more characters and produce more cartoons. As put by animation historian Michael Barry, the Fleischer's original characters to this point were usually dull or unsympathetic, so they had little confidence in swiftly developing an original breakthrough cartoon star of the same calibre as Mickey. Instead, taking cues from the earliest animated shorts, they looked to comic strip pages for, again in the words of Barrier, ready-made characters. As one of the most popular of the time, the Fleischer's found Popeye ripe for the picking and made attempt to procure a deal with King Features to license Thimble Theatre characters for use in their shorts. Before agreeing on a full contract or a full series, the Fleischers were requested to create a test cartoon, and Popeye and his pals would thus debut in 1933 Betty Boop short Popeye the Sailor, which was produced in secret and animated single-handedly by Roland 
Crandall away from the rest of the studio. As such, the short was effectively a Popeye cartoon guised as a Betty Boop, with Popeye its true star and Boop only making a fleeting appearance, the first and only encounter the two would ever share on the screen. Likewise, most of the short's focus was put on various other Thimble Theatre characters, including Olive Oil and the villainous Bluto, who had only appeared in one comic strip to that point. The rivalry between Popeye and Bluto was put front and centre, with the two vying for the affections of Olive Oil, fighting for her in a series of challenges where each would continuously one-up the other. The short also saw Olive Oil kidnapped by Bluto and Popeye coming to her aid with the help of his trusty spinach-inherited powers. The short immediately created what would become a heavily utilised formula for Popeye shorts and turned Spinach and Bluto, who were both incredibly obscure pickings from the comics, into undeniable trademarks of the Popeye brand. The short also debuted the classic Popeye the Sailor Man song, which would become the character's standard and eventual theme tune. King Features were so impressed with the short that they signed an exclusivity contract with the Fleischers before it was even released, licensing the characters for an initial five years in a deal which would eventually grow to last decades. Upon release in July of 1933, the short was an enormous success, and it suggested that this was perhaps owed in large part to its billing as a Betty Boop short, dragging in larger audiences and thus invoking a larger response. The Fleischers quickly went into production on their fully fledged Popeye series. With the second instalment, I Yam What I Yam releasing that September, a third, Blow Me Down releasing that October, and a further three released by the end of the year, offering monthly instalments there on out. The series and its characters became the most popular the studio had ever produced, eclipsing even Betty Boo. It didn't matter that the Fleischers threw away Seeger's more complex story arcs and sprawling plotlines in favour of their formulaic game gag-laden template. Popeye became more beloved than he ever was in comics. Polls taken in 1935 even show that the popularity of the character may have superseded that of Mickey Mouse for a very brief period. Popeye's fame was so influential in fact that over the next decade he was subject to much parody by the Slesinger Studio and Warner Brothers Looney Tunes. And records show that spinach sales soared in the US by over a third. Popeye was initially voiced by William Costello known as Red Pepper Sam for close to 30 shorts. However, Lou Fleischer, the head of the studio's music department, noted that he became entirely incorrigible as his severe alcoholism got in the way of his work. Lou was put in charge of finding a new voice for the character and upon hearing in between animator Jack Mercer singing the Popeye theme around the studio, hired him on the spot. 1935's King of the Mardi Gras was Mercer's first short, with his performance described by Barrier as, as gravelly and quirky as Costello's, but considerably warmer and more flexible, giving the character a dimension he lacked in earlier films. Due to the sound on the early Popeyes being post-synced instead of recorded prior to animation, much of their dialogue was ad-libbed. Mercer was a master improviser and provided Popeye with his trademark mumbles and grumbles so inherent to his humour and popularity. The Fleischers were no stranger to an on-the-fly style of production, and additionally saw no use in utilising pencil tests resulting in crude, unrefined animation. Instead of trial and error experimentation, there was, in Barrier's words, a more off-the-cuff feel, working in the favour of the comic strip style. Model sheets used to keep characters visually consistent across series weren't utilised either, so Popeye's design slightly altered as different animation teams rotated from short to short. Most notably, the size and shape of Popeye's face differed between units. Some some shorts saw him with a long protruding chin, while others saw him with one more bulbous. Some saw him with tiny round ears, others with large round ears, and others with long ovular ones. Popeye spawned during the age of rubber hose animation, aptly named for the rubbery appearance of characters and a style that the Fleischers had used heavily for great comedic effect, almost as a trademark. Grounded in unreality, rubber hose suited Popeye perfectly and can be attributed to making the surrealist short so popular. Animator Myron Waldman would note, it might have been just a fluke, a lucky break, that the Seeger characters fit the Fleischer style so well. 
By 1934, however, the Disney Studios shorts were becoming more intricate and highly focused on story and character. Technically, they were also showcasing more realistic animation due to their newly developed squash and stretch style, allowing characters to appear to have real weight and mass and abide by the rules of gravity. The Flashes realised their style of animation was growing outdated, and like many other studios at the time, conformed with this Disney style. They began devoting more effort to the shorts, employing drastic pre-planning, refining animation and, in the words of animator Dave Tendler, working out stories more carefully in much more detail. As a result, Popeye's design gained a consistency and shorts became more lifelike, though retained elements of rubber hose gag work so inherent to their formulation. As the Disney Studio currently had exclusivity over the three-strip Technicolor process and the two-strip process paled in comparison, the early shorts were produced in black and white. Popeye, in fact, did not appear in colour until 1936's Popeye the Sailor meets Sinbad the Sailor, a two-reel short running at 16 minutes, twice the length of a regular Popeye. This was followed by two more two-reel colour features. 1937's Popeye the Sailor meets Ali Barber's 40 Thieves, and 1939's Aladdin and His Wonderful Lamp, the longest of the three, running at 21 minutes. Centering around the tales from the 1001 Nights, these were the only colour Popeyes produced by the Fleischers, and were made solely to convince Paramount to fund a feature-length film starring the character. If the distributor agreed, it could have been the first ever feature animation. However, Paramount first wanted to see how Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, ridiculed by the press as Walt Disney's folly, fear critically and commercially. The specials heavily utilised the Fleischer's stereoptical process, which allowed placement of film cells in and around three-dimensional model sets, their answer to Disney's multiplane camera. It was a highly effective technique, adding an innovative, dreamlike, fantastical feel. The shorts, marketed as 3D cartoons, were instant fan favourites and are amongst the most stunningly animated Popeyes. Impressed with them and convinced by Snow White's eventual acclaim, Paramount agreed to fund the 80-minute cartoon feature Gulliver's Travels, released in 1939. Though Popeye had initially been planned to take the lead role and was the impetus of the film in the first place, the Fleischers strangely decided against it. With the US entrance into World War II following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the Popeye shorts were given a drastic overhaul. The character was evidently drafted into the US Navy with his outfit changing to the standard US naval attire. Beginning with The Mighty Navy, in a sizable series of World War II themed shorts, many considered propaganda today, Popeye was less often seen fighting off Bluto for the affections of Olive and instead seen using his spin fueled powers to fight off the Axis enemies. This change reflected the shifting attention of audiences, who had become drawn to mischievous, rebellious troublemakers. Other rebel rousers such as Donald and Daffy Duck both rose to fame in the era via similar war-themed shorts, while wholesome characters like Mickey Mouse were dropped from favour. Likely, only for sake of variety, a small number of shorts using the original Popeye formula were produced in this period. At this same time, the Fleischers found themselves swimming in debt, which slowly broke down their professional and personal relationship, led to a studio division and a drop in quality of their film output. Despite producing a number of series, the Popeyes remained the only ones drawing crowds and making money, so cinemas began rejecting those that didn't star him. The Fleischers had to use Popeye revenue to offset Paramount's $250,000 lost on the rejected cartoons, and a Additionally, found themselves penalised $350,000 by the studio for going over budget on Gulliver, an accumulative debt equivalent to almost $11 million adjusted for inflation in 2019, which they failed to pay. Despite finding great success with their 1941 Superman short and attempt to exploit a profitable character to cover their dues, their second feature-length venture, Mr. Bug Goes to Town, released that same year, bombed at the box 
office and didn't even recoup its production costs. With Superman being signed, an entire series projected to cost more per installment than any cartoon they'd ever made, in fact four times more than the Popeyes, it seemed almost impossible for the Fleischers to work themselves out of the debt. This was the final straw for Paramount, who forced the Fleischers to resign from their own company and called their loan. The Fleischer studio was thrown into bankruptcy, and Paramount effective immediately took control of it, rechristened it Famous Studios, and continued the various productions. After 109 shorts, the final Fleischer produced Popeye was released in July of 1942, with the first famous Popeye releasing that August. It's unlikely that audiences even noticed the changeover, as the early famous Popeyes were almost indistinguishable from the later Fleischers, continuing to utilise the World War II backdrop and story focus. In fact, the naval costume designs had become so iconic of the characters in this era, famous studios continued to use them well after the end of World War II in 1945. However, as famous began to forge their own path with the series, they made a few notable shifts. 1943's Cartoons Ain't Human, Famous's 14th Popeye short, was the final produced in black and white, with the following, Her Honor the Mayor, the first produced in colour, marking a new stylistic direction for the series. Famous would notably develop their own Popeye formula, depicting a love triangle between the three leads. Most shorts would see Olive Oil falling for Bluto, and Popeye vehemently trying to win her back, usually beating his rival to a pulp with the help of spinach. With this change, Famous also mixed up character designs. Bluto was made larger and more muscular, the prototype of a burly man, while Olive Oil was given more attractive features, such as smaller feet, lusher hair, and large round eyes, moving away from the small black dots used by the Flashers. She essentially became more feminine and less goofy. However, this also resulted in a new, less attractive, superficial personality. Popeye, on the other hand, was kept much the same. However, likewise, gained large round eyes, and in four shorts was randomly seen in a blue uniform. With the extra cost and man hours associated with the switch to colour, the studio could no longer produce monthly instalments, releasing an average of eight annually in following years. The Popeye series managed to crawl into the 1950s, but after a decade of formulaic stories rarely offering anything new, animation historian Lennon Moulton notes that they began to lack the ambition and sophistication of the earlier efforts. Additionally, they had been gradually toned down over the years, focusing less on crude, edgy humour, and finding a style aimed more towards children. Overall, audiences grew tired and uninterested. In 1953, Famous produced the first and only 3D Popeye short, Popeye the Ace of Space, in an effort to win back the audience. While initially well received, other than being a fun one-off gimmick, it did little to revive the overall popularity of the series. As the 50s drew to a close, the golden age of theatrical animation was nearing its end, and television was rapidly becoming the entertainment vehicle of choice for audiences. While some of the more popular cartoon characters managed to survive theatrically into the early 1960s, others, such as Popeye, couldn't even see the decade out, with 1957 seeing the release of his final theatrical short, Spooky Swabs, the 122nd under Famous and 233rd overall. Famous continued to make theatrical cartoons of decreasing quality based around other original characters, until 1969 when Paramount closed the arm. Popeye did, however, like many of his cartoon brethren, find an afterlife on TV, becoming one of the first, alongside Bugs Bunny, to transition onto the medium with original content. Much like many other theatrical cartoon series, early Popeyes had been airing on TV since the mid-50s, and managed to reinvigorate audience interest in his classic material. Considering Paramount only owned theatrical rights, King Features, who didn't earn a cent from the TV syndication, saw a great opportunity to capitalise on their IP, and commissioned a brand new series, Popeye the Sailor, originally airing on ABC between 1960 and 1962. King Features utilised the limited animation style, prominent on television animation of the time, for the sake of faster, more efficient production. Limited animation made use of shortcuts such as less detailed drawings, recycled animation, held cells and still characters. And while it often resulted in glaring errors and questionable artistic choices, 
choices, the series was a ratings hit and beloved by audiences, though modern fans don't view them as favourably. While The Fleischers and Paramount had churned out 9 to 12 shorts a year, King Features produced 220 shorts in only two. That's just 13 shy of the total number of theatricals produced in almost 25 years. To achieve this, King Features additionally outsourced the work to a variety of studios concurrently. Jack Kinney Productions produced 101 shorts, Seymour Nitel produced 63 under Paramount Cartoon Studios, Gene Deitch and William L. Snyder produced 28 under Rembrandt Films Hallis and Bachelor, Larry Harmon Pictures produced 18, and Gerald Ray Studios produced 10. While the multiple studios tried their best to find a consistent artistic look, marginal differences in character design and animation style are evident across the cartoons, leading to an overall series style that has been described as schizophrenic. The Kinney cartoons use an overly rounded style with less detailed character designs, which are probably further from resembling the flight famous shorts. The Paramount cartoons use a likewise circular design, though feature characters that most resemble the earlier ones, helped by the fact that many artists who worked on the famous shorts were working on these. The Deitch and Snyder cartoons are surprisingly the most refined shorts design-wise. The Harmon cartoons use a more angular design motif and are amongst the most visually different shorts, alongside the Ray shorts, which take on a stylized, almost surrealist treatment, with far less detailed backgrounds. Character designs mostly mimic those from Paramount's later shorts, even returning to the large rounded eyes. While Popeye would occasionally change costume, notably wearing his original black uniform in the series pilot Barbecue for Two, he was most often seen in his white naval uniform. Olive Oil, on the other hand, returned to her ganglier, more awkward design traits and her classic clothing, while Bluto, now renamed Brutus, became less hulking and more obese, now wearing casual clothes. In in fact, these changes were made to the character as Paramount barred King Features from using Bluto, incorrectly believing they had originated the character in their shorts, even though King Features, who obviously didn't bother to fact check, originated him in Thimble Theatre. Story-wise, while retaining gag-centric narratives and occasionally using the early Fleischer battle formula, Thimble Theatre strips served as a large inspiration, with many being adapted. Some cartoons even featured characters never used in the theatrical shorts. Popeye the Sailor remained hugely popular long after its initial run, with the cartoons playing in syndication well into the 1990s. Additionally, ABC aired 60 minute tally movie Popeye Meets the Man Who Hated Laughter as part of their Saturday Superstar Movie Anthology program. This was an ambitious project animated by Filmation, which crossed over many of King Feature's comic strip characters, including Popeye and the Thimble Theatre crew, Flash Gordon, The Phantom, Mandra the Magician, Beetle Bailey, and Quincy. The special featured limited animation and appeared highly stylized and cruder in style than any Popeye cartoon to date. Characters mostly returned to their classic Thimble Theatre designs, with Popeye notably being featured in his original black outfit. Meanwhile, Popeye continued to thrive in the printed medium, having become the star of his own fully-fledged comic series in the late 1940s, which, like the TV series, blended elements from both the shorts and the original strips. So continually popular was the Popeye brand that by the 1970s, the Thimble Theatre starring Popeye, still in syndication, was renamed eponymously to Popeye. Publication of Popeye comic books have continued sporadically throughout the decades, however the Popeye strips continue in syndication as one of the longest running in history. In 1978, Hanna-Barbera Productions were tasked with returning Popeye to television screens with the all-new Popeye Hour, airing on the CBS Saturday morning lineup. Though the series ran in an hour-long block, it was placed alongside Hanna-Barbera's Dinky Dog, with both shows half an hour in duration. The series returned to the roots of the Thimble Theatre, presenting narratively focused stories and characters in original iterations, even featuring dotted eyes once more. Popeye would, however, appear in a blue variant of his classic costume. Due to censorship restrictions on children's television at the time, the series, while still featuring elements of the classic Fleischer battle formula, stripped back much of their violence. Most notably, Popeye is never seen punching his nemesis, who is named Bluto again, often lifting and throwing him instead. While multiple cartoon shorts made up the full half-hour program, during the second season in 1979, the Popeye Valentine special Sweethearts at Sea aired, presenting a full 
full half hour feature episode. In 1982, the show was separated into a single half hour series renamed as The Popeye and Olive Show. The series overall lasted until 1983 for 53 episodes and over 160 shorts. It would run in syndication for many years, airing in the UK as late as the early 2000s. After losing a bidding war to produce a film based on the stage musical Annie, in turn based on the Little Orphan Annie comic strip, Paramount, who still owned theatrical rights to Popeye, decided to make their own comic strip inspired musical. Thus, in 1980, Popeye became the focus of his very own live action musical comedy film, based on Thimble Theatre storylines. Directed by Robert Altman and featuring bizarre original songs by Harry Nilsson, Popeye was produced in a joint collaboration between Paramount Paramount and Walt Disney Productions. The film starred Robin Williams as Popeye in his debut film performance, Shelley Duval as Olive Oil and Paul L. Smith as Bluto. Popeye has been well documented as a near disastrous production, with many onset mishaps leading to an inflated budget. It's suggested that Altman may not have even completed shooting the film when Paramount demanded he turn in his footage. While successful at the box office, earning double its budget, the movie underperformed against studio projections and received mixed response from both audiences and critics. Roger Ebert called it sophisticated entertainment, while Leonard Moulton found it astonishingly boring and unfunny, comparing it to a sinking ship. The film, while not beloved by fans, has gone on to become a so bad it's good cult classic today, and remains the last Popeye production produced by Paramount Pictures. Hanna-Barbera returned to Popeye cartoons in 1989 with short-lived series Popeye and Son, which aired on CBS for 13 episodes and 26 shorts. The series focused on Popeye and Olive Oil as a married couple with a son named Popeye Jr. Jr. in fact was the main focus of the series, which followed his exploits using spinach fueled powers inherited from his father, despite having a distaste for the vegetable. Bluto returned to the series with his own family, though his rivalry with Popeye persisted, as did one between his son Tank and Junior. The series maintained the artistic style of the earlier Hanna-Barbera series, but gave the characters a more modern aesthetic. Popeye was often seen in a Hawaiian shirt and blue cap, with olive oil in a pink tracksuit, and Bluto in a colourful suit and tie. Much like the previous series, Popeye and Son also relied on classic Fleischer era sensibilities and rubber hose gag work, featuring even less violence. As the first series produced since Jack Mercer's death in 1984, Popeye was now voiced by Maurice LaMarche. For the entirety of the 1990s and most of the early 2000s, Popeye simply existed on screens in syndicated reruns, as audience desire for new Popeye material had waned over time. In 2004, Popeye's Voyage The Quest for Pappy was released by Lionsgate Entertainment as a director video feature celebrating the character's 75th anniversary. The film was the first original Popeye production in 15 years, debuting the characters in CG animation for the very first time, in designs highly styled off the Fleischer cartoons. The storyline, which sees Popeye, now voiced by Billy West, on the search for the missing poop deck Pappy, was inspired by Thimble Theatre, that retained the love triangle elements of the famous shorts, even though Bluto is strangely presented as Popeye's first mate. The animation was produced by Mainframe Entertainment in a low-budget limited CG style, leading to much criticism. In 2010, however, Sony Pictures Animation announced they had secured rights to Popeye for a CG animated theatrical film, with Samurai Jack and Dexter's Laboratory creator Gendy Tartakovsky at the helm. Tartakovsky said he planned to explore how Popeye would translate from the old 30s and 40s cartoons to today, and planned to contemporize him without losing the heart and sincerity of what Popeye really is. In 2014, a short animation test was released showcasing a gorgeously animated sequence filled with classic Popeye gag work. The test footage was highly praised, however the project never eventuated, with Sony instead releasing the Emoji Movie in its place. Sony insists the project is still in active development, however the last official update came in January of 2016. 
Surprisingly, as of 2018, Popeye has been appearing in a series of YouTube web shorts titled Popeye's Island Adventures, with animation produced by UK animation house Wild Brain Spark Studios. The series features limited digital flash animation, with characters appearing in traditional designs. This collection of, so far, 25 episodes doesn't really draw inspiration from any previous Popeye media other than featuring slapstick gags and a constant rivalry between Popeye and Bluto. As the series is marketed by King Features as Popeye for Kids, these are the most watered down Popeye shorts so far. They feature no violence whatsoever, incredibly tame and unfunny jokes and gag work, and absolutely no romantic subtext whatsoever. Here, Bluto doesn't even really appear as a villain, but more so a bothersome neighbour. The shorts, which have relatively low view counts, have received incredibly lukewarm reception, with fans noting their inability to capture the essence of the source material and their poor attempt to adapt to modern susceptibilities. And unfortunately, that just might be the problem here. It seems Popeye hasn't exactly seen a great deal of success outside of comic strip publication since the TV era in the late 70s, early 80s, though even then he was showing signs of a struggle to keep up with the times. 50 years on from then and 90 years since his inception, Popeye exists as yet another cartoon casualty of the modern era. One whose style and sensibilities are so inherent of their past that any small change can undermine the character entirely. For now, he may exist as but a mere shell of his old self, but I feel under the right leadership and in the correct format, he can continue to sail the seven seas of popularity and live to fight another day. Until then guys, let me hand you the wheel. I want to know, what is your favourite Popeye appearance of all time? How would you like to see him revived, or would you simply just want to see him buried at sea? Drop your anchors down in the comments below, and let me know your thoughts. If this is your first time viewing one of my videos and you'd like to see more like it in the future, then please don't forget to hit that big old subscribe button up on your screen, as well as that like button down below for that little extra support. Also don't forget to check me out on social media, and please consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and have a fantastic day.